Yeah, so thank you very much for that introduction. Um, yep, so my name is Jessica Miller and I'm an editorial coordinator working on two journals at the Royal Society, Journal of the Royal Society Interface and Interface Focus. And first of all, um, I'm going to go over what I mean um, by open science. So um, there are a number of concepts that are included in open science activities. And these include open access publication, open data, transparent peer review, depositing research on preprint servers, pre-registration and replication, and peer review recognition. And open science advocates hope that opening up science will improve the quality of research and its ability to be replicated. And it's hoped that innovations such as preprint servers are ways to speed up research. So not only does better research get to those who need it, but it gets there more rapidly. And now I'm going to go over um, some of the uh, models of open access. Um, and specifically tie these to um, sub-funding. Um, so many funders of science, especially public funders, require work to be open access. And different models of open access exist. So these include diamond or platinum. Um, this is essentially free to authors and um, readers. Um, gold, um, which essentially um, usually involves paying a fee to the publisher um, to publish rather than the reader paying to access. However, um, there are other forms of um, ways of covering the costs, which I will go over later. Um, and then green, which is a free option where the author effectively self archives. And each model um, has its pros and cons. So Diamond is optimal for the researcher and reader costs and has many practical advantages of open access. However, there may be questions about the financial sustainability of the model. And funding can come from a variety of sources, including society funds and donor funds. Um, gold is good for readers and for publishers and also allows authors to widely share and reuse their work um, whilst also retaining copyright. Um, it is worth bearing in mind that not all publishers are commercially minded and profits generated by society publishers often supports other charitable activities. Um, so for example, profits um, generated by Royal Society Publishing go back into the wider work of the Royal Society allowing its um, activities to carry on. And um, green open access is the second cheapest option for researchers. It's much more limited in its scope and authors may have to um, give up their copyright. Um, and there are various advantages of open access, which I've been over, um, but these are reiterated um, on this slide. Um, so I've got advantages for authors, readers um, and publishers. Um, so as I said, we've been over quite a few of these already, um, but it does help authors to meet um, funder mandates um, for open access. Um, it also means readers can easily reuse published work, um, providing they cite the publication. And there are a number of ways that Royal Society Publishing um, supports open access. So firstly, um, we have two op fully open access journals. Um, that's Royal Society Open Science and Open Biology. And across all the other journals, which are um, what we call hybrid journals, there are open access options. So effectively, um, the authors can decide if they want to um, publish open access. Um, three, four, four, thirdly, um, four of our um, journals, that's Proceedings A, Proceedings B, Biology Letters, and Journal of the Royal Society Interface are transformative journals, and they will move to a full and fully open access model once 75% of articles are being published um, open access. Um, we also have a number of um, prepaid 
um, open access options for authors um, that have been agreed with institutional libraries. Um, so, for example, our read and publish deals are based on a model in which the library pays any charge fees directly rather than uh, requiring the author to pay. Um, so, for example, we have a read and publish agreement with the University of Cambridge, and this means that um, any open access fees for the University of Cambridge authors who publish with us are covered. Um, and this takes the financial pressure off the authors um, and means they don't have to, sort of, for example, pay out of their grants. And a large number of institutions around the world are involved in read and publish deals with the society and the number continues to grow. Um, an alternative approach, the open access membership schemes. And in this model, institutions pay an upfront fee to the society. And in return, authors at those institutions receive a discount on their article processing charge fee. And we also support researchers who do not, who may be at institutions that, who do not have the resources to pay for open access. Um, so for example, we support the Research for Life initiative, um, which grants institutions um, and authors um, in developing countries free open access uh, for the fully open access journals um, and access uh, to content, paywalled content for the, tra um, the transformative uh, agreement journals. Um, and moving on to talk about open data. Um, so a key feature of open science is access to the increasing availability of research data. And this um, not only means the result uh, from your study that supports your paper's conclusions, but also other digital material and code or details of algorithms. Um, so, for example, a researcher working in paleontology may provide not only details of where the fossils they or originated um, can be found, so, for example, which museum, but also photographs and CT scans, as well as any other measurements taken. And there are a number of advantages of depositing data. Firstly, it allows research outputs to be verified, and it also helps others avoid errors and build on your work. And some repositories also provide DOIs for data sets, and this means that data can be cited more easily. And publishers are increasingly partnering with third party providers of data repositories um, in order to make it as simple as possible um, for authors to deposit um, their data in a public recognized repository um, and to meet data mandates. Um, so, for example, the Royal Society Publishing um, covers the costs of authors depositing um, their data in the Dryad digital repository. Again, there are a number of advantages of open data for um, authors, readers, um, but also for the wider scientific community as a whole. Um, and I've uh, gone over some of them um, on these on this in this table. Um, so, for example, it means data can be reused and repurposed. Um, also means uh, results can be tested and verified uh, more easily. Um, now I'm going to talk about another sort of aspect of um, open science, um, uh, that's transparent peer review. So peer review can sometimes be seen as a, a sort of black box um, where readers may be unclear about why a paper is um, published. And transparent peer review um, can help to open up the black box and show the journey um, to publication and um, the overall sort of rationale uh, for publication. Um, and a number of Royal Society journals operate a single blind transparent peer review model. Um, and in this model, the referee um, identities are anonymous, although um, referees are permitted to sign um, their reviews if they wish to. Um, however, this is absolutely not mandatory. Um, however, the outputs, and um, this includes the reviewer comments, 
the editor comments, the decision letter, and the response um, from the authors to say how they've actually addressed. The reviewer comments um, are published alongside an accepted paper. And the value in transparent peer review um, lies not only in helping readers understand why a paper was published, but it also can help produce some of the biases that are present in the review process. Um, if all parties know their comments will be accessible after publication, it is hoped the better reports will be prepared. And there are some key advantages of transparent peer review, which are shown on this slide. And the relative advantages for authors is denoted by, by an A, and the relative advantage for reviewers is denoted um, by an R. Um, so again, we've been through quite a lot of these um, points already, um, but readers, um, particularly those who are early career researchers and are just um, getting started with um, peer review, um, could learn quite a lot about sort of how to um, write a peer review from actually um, seeing um, peer reviews which have been published alongside um, papers. Um, and it could also help to encourage um, better written reports. So it's hoped that if um, the referees know that their comments will be made public, um, they'll be uh, maybe thinking more carefully about um, exactly how they, they write their review um, comments. And um, moving on to talk about uh, preprints. So these have been common in some fields uh, for some time, um, especially the physical sciences, and more and more preprint servers are becoming available um, across um, a variety of fields. Um, so some of these, such as Research Square, cover all fields, and some are specific to certain disciplines. So for example, Bioarchive is um, specific to biology. And preprints allow authors to share their work prior to formal peer review. And many preprint servers allow readers to comment on posted content, which allows authors to gain feedback on their work before submitting it to a journal for formal review. And they also allow authors to claim credit for ideas as many, if not most recognized preprint servers assign DOIs to deposited manuscripts. And it's important to note that journals, funders, researchers and research assessment bodies may see preprints in different terms from one, one another in regards to what constitutes a publication. And this can also vary depending on the academic field. So, for example, researchers in certain fields may consider the deposition to be publication. However, Many research funders or assessment bodies do not consider this to be publication and require authors to also have published in a preprint uh, peer reviewed journal as well as or instead of a preprint server. And similarly, it is worth bearing in mind that while many journals do not consider preprints to be publications, others do see deposition in a preprint as a server as a form of publication and this may prejudice the chances of the manuscript being published in the journal. Um, and as well as opening up the outputs of scientific research, many publishers and other organisations are trying to encourage a culture that not only permits but actively promotes reproducible science. And reproducibility can cover a range of aspects of open science, but I wanted to pick out three additional aspects. So the first of these is registered reports, which have been common in psychology and related fields for some years, but also becoming more widely spread across other fields. And briefly, they're an article type in which peer review is split into two phases. The first phase assesses the proposed study design to test, for instance, the statistical power of the proposed methods and analysis. And if the reviewers and editors are satisfied by the stage one registered report, it receives an in-principle acceptance. The authors then register their protocols and study design in a suitable repository before 
conducting the research according to the peer reviewed and pre-registered design. And after this, a second round of review takes place. However, the referees and editors do not assess the paper based on the study's outcome or results. Um, even if the authors get null results, this is not relevant to the stage two registered report. As long as the authors have conducted the study as a grade, agreed in stage one, the paper will be accepted for publication, regardless of the study's outcome. And the point is to test the study designed by peer review rather than testing the results per se. And the next are replication studies and a growing number of publishers are providing avenues for formal replications of existing work. And this should be encouraged. Again, studies are assessed on the study design rather than the results. And pre-registration of replication studies should be encouraged. And finally, the assessment and publication of negative studies is another important part of reproducibility. And this includes studies that try to demonstrate a null effect and those that demonstrate a failure of study design or outcome. Both registered reports and replication studies can or should provide a way to publish negative studies, but some journals allow negative studies which haven't been registered. Very often experiments fail and by publishing failed results, it helps others with their future experiments. I'm now going to go on to talk about how COVID has affected existing approaches to open science and how has it accelerated trends in some areas. So I'm just going to read out the quotation on the slide. Um, the sharing of the SARS-CoV-2 genome seen as the poster child for open science and that pandemic held up as a turning point for open science. This comes from the Royal Society and demonstrates an increased awareness of an interest in open science has been driven by the pandemic. And several publishers answered a call from the Wellcome Trust to move to more widely share research outputs. And this was done in a number of ways. Firstly, they encouraged authors submitting COVID research to also post a copy of their work to a suitable preprint server. Secondly, they also allowed authors to transfer their peer review histories between journals if they were rejected. And this aimed to help reduce decision times as well as author and reviewer fatigue. And thirdly, the Royal Society and other publishers took down paywalls so that access was not interrupted when people were working differently. And this was seen as a good move by libraries and users. And we also saw the um, use of preprint by preprint submissions uh, by authors ex really expand during the pandemic. And um, interestingly, the number of accept and reject final decisions seem to be similar between preprint submissions and regular submissions. And a number of journals, including Royal Society Open Science, um, committed to rapid peer review of pre-registered studies examining COVID. And as discussed in an earlier slide, one of the major advantages of pre-registering a study this way is that it allows authors to design better studies. And this was particularly important in encouraging authors to conduct robust studies that could help address COVID. And many journals modified their post acceptance processes to speed up um, publication of accepted research. And the scholarly communication in times of crisis, the response of the scholarly um, communication system to the COVID-19 pandemic report um, was prepared by the coalition of publishers who had responded to the Wellcome Trust call for more rapid sharing of research. And it recommended that efforts to promote for open science need to be further intensified. And among the recommendations were calls for action in more um, encouraging preprinting, more effective data sharing, innovation in peer review processes and improvements in access to and quality of scholarly publishing metadata. So, for example, access to citations, data sets, abstracts and author identities. 
And I'm now um, going to spend the last part of this um, webinar just exploring some of the future directions for open science. So to, to address where next, I will be referencing some of the Royal Society's work in this space. So in 2015, the Society hosted the Future of Scientific Scholarly Communication Conference. And this formed part of the celebrations to mark 350 years of publication for the Philosophical Transactions Journals, which are the world's oldest continuously published journals. And a range of stakeholders, including senior scientists, early career researchers, funders, institutions, representatives from academies and societies, publishers, the technology sector, science communicators and industry, all came together to explore the state of scholarly publishing. And underpinning the discussion was the concept of open science and its future prospects. And over the two days, topics covered all aspects of scholarly communication. However, three topics stood out. Firstly, the importance of fostering greater collaboration between all parties. Secondly, a recognition of the need to drive change in research culture. And finally, encouraging greater use of pre and post publication services. The recordings from the meeting and the subsequent written report are freely available to online and are worth reading. And um, in 2012, the Royal Society published the Science as an Open Enterprise Report. And this came out of a major study on the use of scientific information as it affects scientists and society. And it's also worth taking a read of this report for kind of more insights into um, the development of open science. And um, finally, uh, there are a lot of themes that could be discussed when we consider where open science may be headed in the future. Um, however, I'd just like to pick out a few of these. So firstly, we want to ensure that we build upon what exists already and continue in the right direction. So for example, where open science practices already exist, um, so in data sharing or pre-registration, they should be encouraged or even mandated. Indeed, many funders have open access mandates um, and many publishers, including the Royal Society, require data sets to be available at publication. Um, however, there is more that can be done here. So firstly, data and other supporting <coughs> material should be accessible to reviewers and editors at initial submission to a journal. And ideally, a mandate would also exist for editors and reviewers to assess the data sets. And this poses a number of challenges for all stakeholders in the publishing and scientific ecosystems. So firstly, authors will need to keep up to date with best practice for data sharing in their field. Publishers and journals will need to ensure that submission systems are integrated with multiple data repositories to minimise the cost and effort required by authors. And editors and reviewers will need to have both the time and expertise to assess data submitted to journals with which they work. And secondly, more work is needed to address reviewer fatigue. Um, and experiments have been carried out for some time by publishers such as eLife and F1000 and to collaborative um, forms of peer review. And in ELEF's model, a consensus peer review is generated by the editors and reviewers working together, which is communicated to the authors to respond to. And other models of transparent peer review include those provided by the peer community in or PCI service, in which preprints are recommended by and reviewed by editors and reviewers in the open, and could be left at that or submitted to one of a group of journals associated with PCI. <laughs> for consideration for publication. And some platforms have also developed that allow authors to submit for review and publication 
sections of papers, for example, just an introduction or just the methods um, rather than the whole paper. And this may result in faster review and ultimately better review too. <coughs> I've already touched on some of the funding models. We expect these to evolve and grow. And finally, a more collaborative research culture would hope help open science. For this to happen, funders, institutions, and other actors in the scholarly research ecosystem need to ensure they reward science for the greater good, rather than rewarding science in a way that is centred on competition. Um, I hope this has been a helpful introduction for to open science. If you'd like to um, have any more information, please do get in touch. And I'd like to open the webinar up to any questions you may have. Jessica, great job. Thank you so much um, for that really important information today. I, While we wait for folks to come into the Q&A tab, I actually have a question myself. You talked a little bit about reviewer fatigue and what, what that means for publishing. Um, you have any thoughts for us on how we can encourage more reviewers or how we can train up those, those newer scientists to really help to increase those reviewer pools? Yeah, um, so at the Royal Society um, Publishing, we actually have a co-reviewing um, policy. Um, so this means um, that if a senior reviewer is reviewing a paper, um, they can invite a more junior reviewer to kind of review alongside them almost, and then they can designate them in the submission form as a co-reviewer. Um, and this could help to sort of train um, the next generation um, and also um, hopefully um, reduce reviewer fatigue because a more senior researcher may have um, some help. Um, so that's one particular policy um, we have. Um, I think also um, limiting sort of how often um, particular journals maybe invite um, reviewers um, um, and just sort of keeping an eye on that. Um, as I mentioned before, there's these sort of more collaborative um, forms of peer review um, and experiments in that going on, um, such as the one with eLife. So just these are just a few examples of how that reviewer fatigue can be addressed. But um, yes, it is it is a problem um, with and researchers have a huge amount of work on their plates um, so, and probably get a lot of review invitations, um, can get a lot of review invitations every day. Right. Um, and we, we do have a follow up question. Is there a minimum age or experience requirement to become a reviewer? Yes. Yeah, so we ask that um, reviewers have a PhD. Um, however, um, if you wanted to be a um, co-reviewer, um, so as I said, um, review a paper alongside a senior researcher, um, that's not a requirement. And I'm going to ask the reverse of that question. Is there any maximum age that um, <laughs> you ask for reviewers to be within? You know, I, I think, you know, as we look at the the aging society in general, and it touches so many segments from science to industry to engineering, we are going to have this, you know, the, the great exit, the great retirement. It, you know, do you have thoughts on how we can really engage those emeritus folks to continue to be involved in science for the reviewing side of things? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. Um, we don't have a sort of policy on such as a kind of max age. Um, um, I think it's something that's, yeah, a very good question that we would want to think about. Yeah, how we engage this kind of um, semi-retired or emirates, um, emirates uh, professors who may be looking um, to continue in the field. Um, so I don't have any um, particular thoughts, but it's a, it is a very good question to sort of think about how we continue to engage them. So yes, um, but yeah, we don't have a maximum age, but I think, yeah, no, it is important to think about. So you also noted in your presentation that referee comments are published. Is there a way or means for the author to reply to those comments from the referees? Um, so effectively with the, the published comments work um, that 
we'll publish the referee comments, but we'll also publish the response to the referees. So um, it's effectively all the history of a submission um, peer review. Uh, so effectively, you'll, the, the author will submit the manuscript, mm -hmm. and the editors will assess it, um, get some, um, if it's good enough, they'll ask reviewers, reviewers will provide their comments, and then the authors, when they provide a revision, will repro uh, provide a point-by-point -point response to reviewers. Um, and then it can often be sent out for review again. Um, and then the reviewers, again, will provide their comments. The authors will provide a response. The editors will make a decision. And all of those documents will be published alongside that paper. So, yes, yeah, so the peer review history is, is includes the um, response from the authors as well um, that's been generated and provided throughout the sort of um, prior peer review process, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, I, I'm gonna build on the question a little bit. Um, and this is probably something that's more in the new age way of reviewing. Um, what about referee comments and how the general public or the public at large may be able to comment on them? Say there's an expert that sees a, refer a referee's comment and has expertise that may address it or assist in raising an issue about a paper. How, how is that handled um, in publishing? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, so I, I don't work on a journal um, that actually does transparent peer review. Um, personally, I wonder if Andrew might have any thoughts on that. Um, so my colleague Andrew is on the webinar and... Um... Yes, hello everybody. Can somebody nod or wave if you can hear me? We can hear you perfectly, Andrew. Lloyd, references aside. Excellent. Yes, well, thank you, Jess, for that uh, introduction and indeed the presentation. Uh, and yes, I work on the, the Royal Society Open Science Journal that incorporates many of the features that Jess has, has addressed. Um, I have one or two other quick comments in response to some of the other questions, but to the, the specific question um, about the public at large. Um, in our journal, we have a, a plug-in with a service that's uh, known as Discus. It's a, it's a public, public commenting platform, in effect, that anybody uh, can create an account and provide a comment on the papers that we have published on the journal's website. Um, and although the, the authors of the paper, I don't think, get a notification, I might be mistaken with that, uh, the authors and the, the commenter, whoever they happen to be, can engage in a dialogue uh, regarding whatever it is the, the, the commenter has, has provided. Um, I think it's not unfair to say that most comments we receive are not necessarily motivated by the wish to engage in a scientific uh, debate. Uh, we have a lot of spam, which we, we moderate and get rid of, um, and even the comments that are more legitimate tend not to be uh, terribly incisive, I think it's probably say, fair to say. But those that, that are kind of more interesting for the authors, they, the authors do, or authors have been known to engage in kind of running backwards and forwards, and usually to a fairly uh, sort of polite standard. But then added to that, there's also the, the more formal comment and reply process we have in uh, most of the Royal Society journals, I think. Uh, I think Interface possibly might be an exception to that rule, um, which would allow uh, a more formal peer review document to be submitted uh, up to about a thousand words or thereabouts um, on a, a published article, which is a bit be peer reviewed by uh, one of at least one of the original uh, referees of the published paper and an independent assessor. And all being well, that will be published with a link uh, on the website to the, the original uh, paper on which has been commented. And the authors, again, are invited through a sort of editorial process to submit a reply to that comment. So there's sort of a, a formal scientific peer reviewed process, if you like, for a comment and reply. And there's that more informal discuss approach as well uh, in the Royal Society of Science, at least. That sounds complicated, but very engaging. <laughs> It's, it's actually the discuss process is, is relatively straightforward from a user's point of view. All you need is to uh, press uh, kind of a button and you can provide your comment and away you go. And then the, the conflict is the kind of editorial team at our side doing the moderation. But so that's anybody can do that. Uh, there's no requirement to be a scientist to do that. And the comment and reply process, the more formal route, is perhaps more of the sort of the, the scientific letters to the editor approach that I think has been raised in the, in the chat. Um, and that is a little more involved, but that's again, that's a uh, a relatively more standard process, I think, for, for the publishing kind of industry, I think, as a whole. 
Very interesting. I don't have anything else in the Q and A or chat. So I, Jessica and Andrew, I'll turn over you just for final thoughts and comments and, um, yeah, thank you. I mean, I if it's all right to just just interject for a moment, I think about a few things in terms of um, uh, ways that we try to engage peer reviewers and things that might improve the sort of peer reviewer fatigue problem. Um, I mean, just you know, uh, mentioned the um, co-reviewing and the like. There's other bits and pieces that might be worth mentioning as part of that. Like I think you mentioned also in the presentation, the transparent peer review process. That's not only does that provide uh, a means to uh, publicly display a peer review history, but also as a, a means that peer reviewers can claim credit for the work they've done, um, hopefully with a DOI as well. So there's a kind of citable output to perhaps uh, kind of encourage reviewers there and build on the credit. Um, we also publish uh, annual lists of thanks to reviewers, those who've opted in to be thanked publicly. There's a list um, that is uh, Sort of signed by the editor in chief for the Royal Society Journals. And that, again, that document has a DOI and indeed the orchids of anybody who's signed it or has opted in to be, have their name listed and it provided the raw kid. And so that kind of very public mechanism for us to be able to say, thank you to our uh, reviewer uh, board, if you like. It doesn't actually solve the direct problem of people getting too many review uh, invitations, which is, I think I was going to kind of mention as passing that. And again, with the co-review point Jess was making, that we're trying to move at Royal Society, I think, to expand our review pool to more junior but qualified scientists, so kind of postdocs, early stage PIs, and so on, principal investigators, are moving away from the more established individuals to try to kind of spread the burden a little more. Uh, and also trying to expand the geographic representation of the review pool that uh, I'm sure if we were to do a quick study of the Royal Society journals, we'd find that the vast majority of our referees, like our authors, um, come from Europe or North America or Australasia, uh, missing out several billion people who could potentially, uh, or certainly hundreds of millions of people potentially, who might be able to review for us. So we're trying to kind of engage what might be broadly described as the Global South in that kind of process a little more effectively. Although that, that is that is difficult uh, for a number of reasons in terms of having access to the networks and the appropriate kind of networks to hook into, but we're working on that. Um, and I think it's in terms of kind of the pub training aspect, again, I think uh, both Diane and Jesse could have touched on this a little bit. Um, the Royal Society is doing a little bit more in that space with activities like this presentation today and more active kind of outreach activities at institutions and so on. And we have indeed put together um, a, a website for early career researchers that tries to provide answers to common questions and provides kind of a degree of passive training, I suppose, um, and various videos and resources that are useful for people to get a sense of what peer review looks like and the like. And again, indeed, the transparent peer review that Jess mentioned and again, she alluded to can be a useful resource there to help the training mechanism. But I think something we would like to do more of uh, in that place with, uh, with resourcing uh, resources allow and so on. And there's the wider, perhaps institutional sort of cultural point there, I think, that exhaustion is driven by volume of uh, review requests coming in. Um, and I think that's something that collectively as a, as a kind of ecosystem, we need to persuade uh, research funders, research assessors um, and the like to think more about holistic assessment of people, but also thinking less about impact factor uh, and moving away from single metrics of quality, never to come to research and looking more broadly um, and trying to have move away from the publish or perish mm -hmm. problems mm -hmm. and um, have fewer, better papers so that your reviewers may be reviewing half a dozen papers a year, but they're better quality papers with more interesting and better science with some of the other things that Jess has talked about in terms of peer registration and so on, um, rather than trying to review 15 papers that are maybe kind of marginal, incremental, perhaps not necessarily very good, but nevertheless end up being published somewhere. Um, and there's maybe something to be said that if we could persuade the landscape somehow to track papers that are rejected, um, you know, maybe some of three strikes and you're out rule or something, I would just be, you know, controversial about it. How you'd do that, I don't know. But I think those are some of the things there. And again, it was sort of, I think with the emeritus point you, you uh, made, Diane, I think perhaps as an argument to say that the more senior people move into a more professional reviewing role as they retire from yeah. kind of the research role. I mean, the, an interesting problem is there about maintaining sort of cur um, currency, for want a better phrase, with, uh, with the literature and, and research and so on, um, or whether they perhaps move into more of a training role for junior scientists, teach them how to review. Um, some thoughts there anyway, which may or may not be useful. Mm -hmm. 